A Chorus Line, a musical loaded with great songs, energetic dancing, an emotional story that can hit close to home, and also Death, Death Justice, and, and the Day of, of Wrath. Well, actually, I'm sure those themes aren't topping any of your lists, but maybe they should. Allow me to explain. History time. The 1970s were a bad time for Broadway. Back in the 1920s, even before the golden age of musicals of the 40s and 50s, there were 80 theaters. By the time 1970 rolled around, there were only 36. New York City itself was in a decline. Families flocked away from the city as crime surged. The city was nearly bankrupt, subways were crawling with crime, and Times Square was turning into a red light district. As a result, they saw many actors and dancers out of work. Dancers Michonne Peacock and Tony Stevens decided to host some taped workshops. They hoped that they would form a professional dance company for the purpose of making workshops for Broadway dancers. Happening very late at night into the early hours of the morning, performers came to the tape session and had discussions about what it meant to dance or to be a performer or their dreams and aspirations. There were a few of these tape sessions. Michael Bennett soon joined, took over, and led its adaption into a musical. Inspired by the stories that the participants shared, he decided to turn it into a show. Marvin Hamlish was brought in to write the songs. Eight of the original cast members were part of these taped sessions. Most of the stories were changed. Only Paul's monologue from Act 2 largely remained intact. It was a tremendous success. It hit Broadway in 1975 and ran for 15 years, holding the title for the longest running show till Cats surpassed it in 1997. For those of you who don't know the story of A Chorus Line, it starts off with a bunch of dancers at a preliminary audition for a Broadway show, and all but 17 are cut. Zach, the director, still has to cut that number down to four girls and four guys. He asks each of them to go down the line and tell him a little bit about themselves. And they all do, telling personal stories about their childhood and beyond. There's a subplot that arises in which Zach, the director, and Cassie, one of the auditionees, is revealed to have a fling years ago. Cassie wasn't making it as a soloist as she had hoped, abandoned post, and had settled to be in the chorus. Anyways, the chorus line is now learning and rehearsing the song, One, a showstopper number featuring a non-present soloist. Then they talk about their futures, how bleak or how bright it is. Zach calls them back in, where he announces it who got the part. Finally, the dancers come back for the final number, One. They're dressed identically and in bright golden costumes. Ironically, the chorus line, who all seems so personal, unique, and human, is now just an indistinguishable performer in the background. But now back to the main point of the video. Now in the first one, as in the song titled One, there is a hidden musical motif buried in that song. It is the Dies Irae. If you watched my Sweeney Todd video series, you guys will know my passion and Sondheim's passion for the Dies Irae. But basically, the Dies Irae is a 15th century Latin hymn which represents death, justice, vengeance, the day of wrath, salvation, and all that stuff. The first two verses sound like this. So many composers have been using this melody, usually at least the first four notes to invoke death, but also those other themes. More composers have been using it more than ever, mainly in film, like Star Wars. In that example, John Williams quoted the entirety of the first stanza except for that last note. Watch my Sweeney videos to learn more. During the song one, there is a long section packed with the Dies Irae's. The original Broadway recording cut out this section, presumably to save disc and vinyl space. However, the 2006 revival recorded it, so I'll be referencing that recording. Let me play a little bit of that. Group two. Group three. rehearsal montage. They're almost all robots reciting their steps as they do them. This isn't realism either, it's abstract. Everybody's working separately but working together to perfect the dance moves. It's like a dream, and but it's also like a factory. On top of that we have a huge chunk of the DS Ray being plunked out. 
Let's listen to the entire section now, and I'll play you the DSE rate to bring it to attention. Group two. interesting, and how this differs from the other examples that quote the DSE array, is that while most examples only quote the first line of the DSE array, or just the first four notes, a chorus line quotes two lines of the DSE array and repeats it multiple times in a row. It is unlikely Marvin Hamlish himself put that in there. Many Broadway composers just write the bare bones of the songs, and it is up to the arrangers and orchestrators to add the meat onto it. A chorus line had several orchestrators, up to five or six. Nobody knows for sure, and the orchestrators themselves really don't know who did what. This particular section of one was probably orchestrated by Hershey K. He was one of the only actual classically trained of the orchestrators. Additionally, here's a snippet of a ballet he wrote in 1951, in which the Dies Irae is used almost identically. I don't get how this connects with the themes of the Dies Irae. The work is called Magic Act, The Entrance of the Magicians, and the ballet titled Cakewalk. Granted, I don't know the plot, but it doesn't seem inherently obvious that death, vengeance, and wrath is associated with magicians making an entrance. So, why is the Dies Irae in a chorus line? It isn't inherently obvious that the show has these metaphors of symbolism. Here are some of my theories. They all might be wrong, or maybe there's a bit of truth to all of them. Theory 1. During this rehearsal montage, the only reason they've been busting their asses all day is to win an audition part, and perhaps the Day of Wrath thing is a reference to the final cuts at the end, who makes it onto Broadway, or who gets left behind. For them, this is the Day of Wrath. Theory 2. The stories in the show basically go in chronological order. The first song is I Can Do That, in which Mike was five years old and had an interest in dancing. The Hello 12 montage is all about saying goodbye to the teenage years that had shaped them so much. And after this one rehearsal is the scene about the future with the song What I Did For Love, in which they discuss about their future prospects and what is to become of them. I believe an extension of this conversation is their actual deaths, or at least the death of their dancing career. Theory 3. Perhaps either Marvin Hamlish or Hershey K. thought, Ooh, this hymn sounds eerie. That would sound really eerie if I used this music over this eerie dancing bit. And it does sound eerie, especially because it's not in the same key. It is constantly transposing, and it's played all in dissonant clustered chords. If you have your own theories, let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you liked it, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.